to the Back in Business podcast. I'm business writer and broadcaster Mickey Clark. And I'm business journalist Liz Barkley, his long suffering sidekick. He specialises in making business understandable. I try hard to understand the word he says. <laughs> <laughs> you got to listen to bits. <laughs> how's, your week, how's your week been? Well, it's been a funny week, really, isn't it? I mean, whether you're having these, these bridges, whether you can get back to the UK, whether you you sort of get stuck in the south of France or wherever. Um, and then you've got the restaurant that that kicked off the week. The government giving us all free meals on Monday, Tuesday and Wednesday. And if you're out if in the sticks, they don't even open on Monday, Tuesday and Wednesday because of costs. But I tell you, a lot of restaurants aren't opening in the centre of town on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday either because of the cost, because it's not viable. Well, you, you have to get between 70 and 80 percent of your covers in before you break cost, in other words, you, before you start making a profit. And that's the problem. So what they're saying is, well, we're not going to open those days because we don't want the extra cost because we're, we're not allowed to build up our full clientele. We can only have 25, 30% of, of covers in. So it's self-defeating. But we've only got so much money to spend. You know, so if we're spending it on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, even if we are getting discounts, presumably we're not spending it on Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Well, that, that's the other problem. I mean, if you looked at the, um, I think it was the Telegraph earlier this week, and they quoted restaurateurs from big chains, none of which would operate around here, in the, you know, out in the boonies. Um, but if they worked in town, they said that the bookings we're taking Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday probably means we won't get the bookings at the weekend. Well, there you are. Wednesday is the new Friday. And as we're recording on Friday, I'm not sure what day of the week this is. So. Well, now, now I've retired or just packed up working, um, one day runs into the other. I don't know which day it is. What do you call this? What do you call this if it's not well, one? Well, I'll, I'll get an email for you from you so I know it's Friday. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, we'd like an email from you. So if you'd like to tell us what's going on in your small business life or in your freelance life, then please, you can find us on LinkedIn. We're on Twitter at business underscore back in, or you can email us at us at backinbusiness.org.uk. Now, our Director of Public Affairs Policy and Communications, Simon McVicker, is here. <laughs> Simon, what about your week? Yes, well, actually, I did pop into the centre of town on uh, Wednesday night, and it was buzzing. Uh, and yet a week, a month earlier was the last time I'd been in town, and uh, it was empty. So maybe Richie's scheme is having some effect. We'll have to wait and see. It's all those lobster and chips. It won't last. <laughs> anyway, but, I mean, the, the big news of this week is all around jobs and uh, the, the number of job losses that has been announced this week is is quite concerning now, uh, especially in the high street where we're seeing people like Curry's, Pizza Express, W. H. Smith, and even uh, now we're hearing today about Travelex, all offloading over a thousand people. Um, and uh, you know, uh, it looks like the end of the furlough scheme um, is now having an impact on jobs, and we're seeing it really, really clearly. Um, uh, this morning, the Chancellor has been on LBC and he has categorically said that the furlough scheme will end in October. He said it cannot go on indefinitely. It is not sustainable. So he's saying people will lose their jobs, but there's going to be plenty of new jobs. Well, are people going to lose their jobs, have the skills to go into the new jobs is one of the questions that I'm worried about. But do you think there's any shifting the Chancellor on the furlough scheme, given that all over Europe, in fact, Australia too, the furlough yeah. schemes are being extended? I don't know. I mean, uh, he, he is saying uh, no. Uh, and it would take a big U-turn, I think, from him now to go back on this. Um, but he may have some other things up his sleeve that he will announce in the budget in, in November. But I do think at the moment, as somebody said, we're looking at a cliff edge this autumn, and maybe the this cliff edge might focus minds a little bit. Naturally, Simon, I mean, we're hearing about job layoffs with big companies, but we know statistically that 80% of the employment force in the UK is made up of startups and small companies. Yeah. And we're not getting a feel for how many of those are laying off people or even going to the wall. No. It's all about the big companies who are taking an opportunity, really, 
to cut costs. Yes, that's right. I mean, you know, maybe, maybe some of the small business organisations like FSB will do some sort of survey, but certainly we, it's very hard. However, the Bank of England are still very optimistic. And uh, although they say the recovery is going to be slower than they expected, they're not expecting it to uh, be that long. And they, they're saying that unemployment will peak at 7.5%, which is double what it is now, but it's not as much as the Office for Budget Responsibility said, where they're predicting 12%. So I don't know, does the bank know something that we don't? Well, uh, but they are also saying, um, yes, let's end the furlough scheme. So it's oh, yes, quite interesting on the that the side. governor said that yeah, yesterday. Yeah. Um, our business editor, Declan Curry, is with us, and so is Professor Mark Hart from Us University, who's been with small businesses for 40 years. Mark, on that very point of how many small businesses are going to the wall, anything you can tell us? Um, well, look, I made a forecast back in March at the beginning of lockdown, um, just trying to get some scenarios that I was working with with the British Business Bank. And I forecast about between 2 and 3 million unemployed by the start of quarter four, 2020. And I think we're heading in that direction. And the bulk of that, as Mickey has said, is, is actually the micro small businesses. Um, the data I was looking at in Companies House is all up, up, up the left because they have, with courts not sitting and, uh, you know, the, the actual not, the obligation to file is no longer um, being implemented. So there's a lot of relaxation of the, of the regulations. It's very difficult to get a feel for this. Um, startups are continuing, but they're by far uh, overshadowed by the amount of closures that are taking place. So I think you're, you're going to hear from Mandy and from, from Tracy, but I think from a small business perspective, what I can see is the furlough scheme has be, been putting off the inevitable. And if it does phase itself out, we're going to see a, a, an absolute catastrophe in terms of jobs this autumn. And I, I think two and a half million unemployed would be pretty much on the money as far as I'm concerned. And, and also, Mark, I mean, one thing that I've been convinced of in some is is that British companies have been guilty of putting themselves on labour for the best part of 20 years now and not really put much thought into the investment in technology and retraining people to do other jobs and handle this technology. You get it round here with the farmers. You know, they've got people going out in the field, armies of them picking apples, thinning them out, doing what they need to do. Whereas if you put your mind to it, there's probably machines that could do that already. Well, I think that there is an argument there, but, uh, you know, we're talking about two sectors this morning about, you know, advanced manufacturing and aerospace, which I think will put, probably put a different perspective on that view, Mickey, to be honest. Um, but certainly for a lot of uh, businesses in the in the food industries, for example, I, I couldn't disagree with that assessment. Um, there is a lack of investment. We know from, and it's not just a Brexit effect over the last four or five years, the, lack, the amount of investment in, in British industry, it's an age-old problem and it's been exacerbated because of the degree of people are not investing people a lot of businesses are sitting on money i'm sure mandy and tracy would say well give give me some of it um but you know i think it is it is true that certainly from the last recession sitting on a lot of cash uh, some of the more productive competitive businesses um and they'll probably eat into every penny of that as we speak um, we'll be here, and I should say that Mandy and Tracy are our small business owners who are here to talk to us about change, and we will be talking to them very shortly. Can I just, though, ask Declan, uh, what's your on this week? Because as uh, Simon said, there have been job losses right, left and centre. Yeah, so we had you know, 1,000 jobs at Pizza Express, and we had 1,700 jobs going at DW Sports, Hayes Travel, 900 jobs there. The Press Association, one of the more reputable and reliable news agencies, calculated that there were somewhere in the region of 26,000 job cut announcements in the month of July. And we know that's a tidy fraction because the government's own figures for what's happening in the job market tell us that there's somewhere in the region of 600,000 fewer people on company payrolls than there were at the start of this crisis. And as we've all been saying so far uh, in this podcast we know there's worse to come because economists across the board are saying when this furlough scheme ends there will be a big jump in unemployment but We've seen a lot of developments this week as well in the broader trend that is transforming business big and small, and that is the advance of technology. And you look at the tech world and you think it's existing on another planet. The high tech index for technology shares, the NASDAQ, 
has it, it has not only hit an all time high every day this week, it's gone beyond 11,000. It's at its highest level ever in recorded history. We have Microsoft in talks to buy the global operations of TikTok and President Trump, like the true property developer he is, sidling up and demanding a cut uh, from that deal. And this morning, or Friday morning, uh, we have Mark Zuckerberg joining the club of centi billionaires, the people whose personal fortune is more than a hundred billion dollars in their private uh, wealth. Uh, D- deal that stuck out for me this week was Amazon's investment in Deliveroo, which is pipeline for a very long time. It's taken the competition watchdog over a year, but it is now happening. What's Deliveroo doing with that money? It's using that money to build its own restaurants, restaurants that you'll never see on the high street. They're going to be in industrial estates. They're just there to make meals for takeaway. And the lesson for small businesses, for small restaurants, small gastro pubs, is that if you're not in the takeaway business and you're not on a takeaway app, life is about to get really tough for you. Mm, we've um, we've sold the high street to Amazon. What you're now saying is that we're selling the restaurants to Deliveroo. I think the question you have to ask yourself, Declan, is if you're not going to invest it in the S&P 500 or the FTSE, where else are you going to put your... And secondly, if the... what do you make of the new Bank of England? The one run by Andrew Lee compared with our the previous incumbent. I mean, neither of them, to me, are great forecasters. Yeah, the new Bank of England... Well, they, they seems seem a bit more upbeat, don't they? Yeah, it seems remarkably in line with the thinking of the Chancellor. Much less space between the Chancellor's thoughts and the Bank of England Governor's thoughts at, uh, at the moment. You know, Andrew Bailey saying yesterday, furlough must end. The Chancellor saying today, furlough must end. There's uh, the stars have aligned, shall we say, between Thread Street and the Treasury. British farms have been as much as they could have in machinery to pick the crops. But you go to farms in the Netherlands, more than evens chance that you've got robots there picking the fruit, picking the lettuces. They've had to invest in this machinery as their way of solving the labour shortage. And that is what's coming here in this country. I was just going to say, Mickey, I hear there was a dog <laughs> joined the conversation in the background. <laughs> it probably... The dog was talking more sense. I, th- I, think, I think it had a remark to make about the Bank of England. <laughs> yeah, <what? laughs> Not quite sure what that was. <laughs> <holds. laughs> it's interesting. We talk about investment and I've been talking about it for uh, well, more than 40 years. I mean, I, I, I had a hairline sunken cheeks and a waistline the last time when I first started talking about it. And we still go on about the reluctance of not all British companies, but certainly a a large percentage of them who just don't want to invest because they want to protect their profit margins. And yet at the same time, we have British... And I think a lot of people are holding on to cash. Yeah. Yeah. And at the same time, though, we have British companies right at the forefront at the bleeding edge of technology and nanotechnology and robotics in artificial intelligence and big data. We're world leaders in those areas. So some investment is happening, but um, the bigger companies are really slow Mm. to follow that lead. We are um, going to talk about supply chains now. Um, And so... I mean, I don't know. From what I'm hearing, some firms are finding they've no problem getting their usual supplies to sell on to the customers. On the other hand, some are finding that the supply chains are fraying. Um, supply chains are the things that happen behind the scenes. You know, I think most of us don't really think about them much until there's an empty space on the supermarket shelf. Or maybe we think about it when we see trucks and rushing up and down the motorway. Um, Professor Mark Hart uh, is the Professor of Small Business and Entrepreneurship Austin Business. Will be the length of my arm, which I am not reading out, <laughs> Mark. <laughs> but supply... No, no need. <laughs> supply don't, chains don't are like that pipe work that we see. You know, yeah. they supply the rooms in our house with water and SD and broadband and so on and so forth. Um, and most of us don't really think much beyond that. Give us a big picture about... How complicated this is! Can you can you do as a spider's web? Yeah, I mean, some of my most boring colleagues at the business school are into supply chains, logistics, uh, operations. Um, I avoid them for coffee. I avoid them for lunchtime sandwiches, and I'd certainly avoid them in the pub in the evening. Um, but it's the glue that makes everything work. It really does. Um, and I think we've spent probably you know the last ten twenty years 
focusing on supply chain optimization, certainly in our, our manufacturing sector in particular. Um, and, I, and I think that we, we've got it down to a fine art and there's been a lot of you know developments in terms of you know the, the classic cliche of just in time, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but when you get a huge shock as we've had since February, March time, then you suddenly realize how important these supply chains are because suddenly the whole notion of just in times, I mean, I work in the West Midlands, so you can imagine what the disaster was for the automotive sector. I mean, they, they, these are global supply chains. And, you know, when you suddenly have a disruption, now what's the disruption about? It's not about, you know, it's about frontiers closing, yes, but, you know, stuff's still moving around. But then, you know, the simple things like absenteeism of people who drive lorries, the mundane stuff, suddenly the whole supply chain begins to grind to a halt. And that certainly has an impact through, not just on the production line at, say, JLR in the West Midlands, but a lot of the small businesses that I work with who are tier two, tier three, tier four, who are reliant upon, I mean, for example, they bring, there's a company I know brings brake um, units in from Italy. They test the quality before it goes anywhere near the production line. They're not getting the brakes. They're not getting the, the brakes into the production line. Bosch electric windows. I mean, the, 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 this is where the whole thing begins to grind to a halt. And nobody has been talking about supply chain, so hats off to you folk this morning. Um, and, you know, for, for me, it's we, we, we have been optimising it. We've been trying to get it right. We're trying to work with manufacturers to make sure they're not holding stock and everything else. Wow. Suddenly, you know, the, the whole notion of, of holding stock has taken on a different mm -hmm. Um, you know, different sense in the, in the current crisis. That then has issues for cash flow as businesses try and respond. It creates demand on other companies who perhaps aren't able to meet that demand to do the stock holding. I could go on. You can see how boring this topic really is, but it is so crucial to every, certainly every manufacturing business in this country. So the question then has been, can we switch to local? And again, you know, interesting to hear from our, our two other guests this morning about the feasibility of that and, and then how, and how quickly you can actually do that. It's all very much, oh, we'll source this locally. But yeah, it's about quality. If you're putting stuff on the production line at JLR, you cannot put any little bit of kit line. So that's my overview, Liz, for the, for the moment. Yeah, I, I had this conversation with my daughter back at the end of March when we first went into lockdown. And if you remember... There were supermarkets short of stuff. Shelves were completely empty. And I said to my daughter, who just happens to drive a 44 ton truck for one of the big supermarkets, what are you playing at? Why, why can't? She said, the warehouses are full to the rafters. She said, you've still then got to get it from the warehouse onto the back of a lorry and out onto the field. She said, that's where the breakdown occurs. We can't get it out fast enough and they're not employing more drivers, they can't. So you find the cracks in that supply chain with that sort of pressure that's applied. But in actual fact, the supply chain's held up quite well. You don't hear of shortages now. In the food sector, yes, Mickey. But, you know, I think there's other perhaps more damaging shortages elsewhere in the, in the economy. Um, is it also a question, it's about sectors? I believe it is, absolutely, sectors. yes. Uh, yeah, and, and also, are there ripple effects? Um, well, yes, because, you know, um, the, the, the connectedness of, of an economy is something people f fail to understand. Um, and certainly from, you know, whether, whether it's goods, and, uh, you know, we, we've got to look at supply chains also from, from the softer stuff, you know, business professions and services, and dare I raise the whole topic of um, freelancers and contractors and the self-employed and all of this supplying their own uh, labor into a whole range of small businesses but the ripple effects are, are enormous because obviously there's a competition of who can get particular uh, supplies of, of, of products um, and then you know as we saw with PPE everyone's trying to get the same thing and therefore you're you're trying to compete in a different marketplace for that material so there's there's a there's a lot of unintended consequences of simply you 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 know you lose, you not being able to get the, the, the your orders filled and everything else is pinching or competing with that supplier so it's actually quite difficult i just want to i do want to bring mandy and tracy in but another just one question for you mark if you don't mind at this point um 
Uh, are we then seeing costs going up? Is it harder then for companies to get the credit they need to buy the stuff they need because the costs have gone up, etc.? You know, are we likely to see some kind of a, a shortage of credit? The bank's not lending? Well, I think a lot of businesses that I've been speaking to in the manufacturing sector, in the Midlands in particular, they've been using things like bounce back loans and Sybils actually get some cash into their businesses to give them that buffer. So they're not running out of cash. Is it actually, um, the, you know, I have no real evidence to show that they're, they're, the costs of what they're purchasing has been driven up, uh, which is impacting upon their margins. That data is not readily available in real time, unfortunately. Um, but certainly there, 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 there are severe implications here, and a lot of businesses who are perhaps further down the food chain, the supply chain, are probably struggling more so than if you're, you know, up near near the, tier, the OEMs, for example, uh, to use that example, that if you're tier one, tier two, you have a better chance of solving problems like that and better credit facilities. But I think it's quite specific and I think, you know, it varies from business to business. So you can have a sector perspective, but I think businesses within those sectors will probably have a range of stories to tell us. Well, let's hear what those stories be. Uh, Mandy Ridyard is financial director for Projumax. That's a small engineering firm that specialises in making parts for airplane wings terrific we <laughs> the first time i've met an airplane wing manufacturer sort and tracy dawson is managing director and chair of the leeds manufacturing alliance and her company specializes in making customized electronics um tracy what are you finding um we found that uh, the announcement of lockdown all our customers are oems so we don't have any products of our own we manufacture for our customers and we fell off a, a cliff. Uh, the, the announcement was made and the majority of our customers stopped. Um, and we found all the components that we, uh, that we use and we need, including the printed circuit boards, are all from the Far East. So there are no component manufacturers in the UK. They, they have, the boat has well and truly sailed. But, that's where we have to source from. And there has been delays, uh, certainly absolutely around the supply chain when China slowed down and stopped, then there was a knock on effect. And six weeks later, we were, we were seeing the effect of that um, to the point that we actually decided to pause for May and um, use that time really to, as an opportunity to look and invest in technology. And I don't like the expression, but it, it, it covers them um, digging deep into all our processes to understand how we could use technology to increase our efficiency and to bolster up our supply chains. You're quite right, Mark. It's, 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 it's all very well and good supplying, you know, finding local supply chains, but it's about quality and it's about um, uh, whether they can deliver. I'd love to supply, I'd love to, I'd love to use all local supplies. It's absolutely impossible for in, in our industry. Um, so I, I was working out what OEM means, original, egg, original equipment manufacturer? Yes, correct. Okay. That's <laughs> so all my customers have their, have their own books and they have electronics in them. So we become the electronic experts. So we we actually specialise in low volume niche type products. So we're not interested in the high volume. That's a that's a completely different game. This link you made about the Far Eastern suppliers is interesting because it's something I've been with for some time that a lot of the stuff we import from China basically isn't good quality. It's not designed. Some of it looks as though it's been thrown together by Del Boy. Um, but the government is going to find itself in the situation that if it wants to replace our 5G network for Huawei, who's going to do it? There's no one in this that's going to be in the position to do it. Actually take a little bit. I'm, I'm not totally sure that everything that comes out of China is rubbish. No, I'm not saying that. But I'm saying that by having that big gap between you and the UK, you are you are putting a stress on your side chain. Oh, absolutely. But given the fact that all the components are manufactured out there, they you know and they had to invest uh, very heavily in their own technology and if you pay the price the product that they produce is a very good high quality product um, and they can still they can still manufacture at a cheaper price than we can and they can get it 
in normal times, uh, the lead times are very short because they can use air freight and get across to us very quickly. When there was no air freight, that's a different. That's when we start to see problems, uh, and we're waiting for uh, containers to come in on the sea. Um, Mandy, let's hear what you have. <laughs> What you're finding? When are we going to need air wings again? Well, probably not as soon as I'd get certain, but um, our supply chains is slightly different to Tracy. So we've actually, as a company, onshored work from um, India and China. So we've been able to be more competitive. Yeah, so we make that. <laughs> we've been competitive at winning work against companies in India and China. So it, work that was in India and China is now in the UK. And I think the UK aerospace industry is very competitive and we export a huge amount of what we make. So my company exports 70% of what we make around the world. And we also import components as well and send components out for treatments and bring them back in again. So it's a very complex supply chain. We haven't had any issues with getting material or exporting, although other companies that I know of in aerospace have where they've been, for example, buying forgings from northern Italy, where at the beginning of lockdown, it was completely closed off. One of the problems that we faced is because of um, Brexit, we were all um, having to um, make parts and keep them in safety stock and buy material to make sure that we could get it in time to get through our process. So when demand dropped off, which in aerospace, the pipelines are fairly slow, so it didn't drop off until May, we are then left with a lot of finished goods stock and a lot of raw material stock that is now not wanted because the schedules have moved out. So our, our issue is probably different to Tracy's. And also the cost where we are supplying things of freight um, is, is going up because we're competing against a, a lot more manufacturers maybe than we were before um, because transport is is a really expensive commodity at the moment and earlier you were talking that you had some pretty gloomy prognostications about your industry and the impact of the of the lockdown on it yeah um but how much is a, of your industry is affected by these time cycles i mean richard branson won't pop along and say can I have a wing for a Boeing 737, please? And you turn around and pull one off the shelf. <laughs> the, these all take years, don't they, to process these orders? Yes. Um, is that affecting it? No, so we normally um, have 10-year long-term agreements. So we're making, oh, not our own products, we're making the OEMs products and we supply direct to OEMs and to tier ones. Um, so, so we are always looking, and we make parts for new planes that are being built. So the problem at the moment is that the airlines aren't taking, so they have long-term agreements with the aircraft manufacturers. So they're not taking the airplanes that they will have committed to because they have options on those. And therefore everything is, is, is stopped and that's moving all the way down the supply chain. So currently my business is 30% down on this year and we're expecting it to be similar next year. Um, and when that comes from a position where we were expecting 20% growth. So we're 30% down on last year and we're expecting 20% growth. And we've grown dramatically in the last five years because we've been very good at onshoring work and being competitive and using digital technology and all the other things that we mentioned earlier. Um, but we, we're going to take probably four to five years for that work to come back. So we have to pivot really quickly in terms of um, in terms of finding new work to fill that latent capacity. So is there a lag between the order being taken and you being able to deliver? I mean, are we talking about years? Um, so we have orders for um, for 10 years out, but in terms of the turnaround in product from raw materials through, it depends on which product it is, but it could take um, it could take three months. On some products, it could be 27 days. But for example, with the advent of technology and new processes, we've taken the lead time down on one of our core products from 31 days to 27 hours. We then are in a function of queue time. So it's not how long it takes to make, it's how much work there is. And pre-COVID-19 in, in um, aerospace, we had a backlog of eight years worth of work. So we had plenty of work to go at. It was feast and now it's spamming. Um, you're, you're talking about four to five years to get back from this. Yes. Is that feasible? I mean, are... that's, that's what the current predictions are, Liz, yeah. yeah. Um, so, but you are saying we will bounce back from this in four to five years or are you saying that if there is a long enough delay hang on a minute guys 
we might have to reconsider? Um, no, we think there'll be, well, there won't be a rebound to what it was, but we think we will bounce to a new future and we have to just work out what that new future is. So there will always be work in aerospace and people will fly again at some point. And new planes are, we do need to manufacture new planes because new planes are more efficient and therefore use less carbon than old planes. So it's really important that we replace old fleet with, with new fleet. And Tra- Tracy, what about your, what about your bounce back time, Tracy? We have a number of problems. Uh, some of it is around uh, staffing. You know, so um, we've many from the local manufacturers uh, in our region are finding uh, the anxiety levels among staff returning back to work from furlough is causing a problem. Um, uh, some of it is, I think, is down to people just getting used to being at home and being paid, which is also a problem. Um, we have a great fear about a second, a second wave and a, and a second lockdown. Uh, with the same sort of impact as the first. Um, but I, I've got to say in the last month, we're starting to see increased inquiries. We've invested really heavily in, in, in software that will uh, just change the way we work completely and our efficiencies. So I'm, I'm pretty positive that there will be, a, but I wouldn't call it a bounce back. I think it's I, I, it feels more like a very slow recovery. Mark. Um... <laughs> People are investing in technology here. Um, is this partly about just looking longer ahead at what the skills are that's going to be needed, about what the technology that's going to be re- needed? I mean, I think what we can see now is, as I was saying earlier, we've got a sort of sense of what the supply chain looked like and all the logistics and all of the technology that was thrown at that. I think we're now looking at how we do it differently. And I think businesses that will survive and surveil uh, take a long while to get back to their levels. I mean, I remember, Tracy, we sat and did a growth a few a few back as part of that program and um you, you, the future was rosy and then all of a sudden you know we have this uh, existential threat to everyone's existence never mind the economy um but but i think that investing is crucial w- what i do know when i look back at every recession and this is a recession that has no comparator i get that businesses who innovate businesses who look at their systems and 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 try and improve and invest are the ones that will survive and be part of the recovery. That is absolutely crucial. I've seen it back in the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, the noughties, and that's a little dot-com bubble, the the crash, and we're going to see it again. So what Tracy is telling us is exactly what will be done. And I'm sure Mandy's got a similar story of saying, look, let's take the time to revisit how we're doing stuff internally. How can we reduce our costs to be leaner as we seek? Um, Mickey... Mickey, for once in 40, you're right. It's about investment. <laughs> well, it always has been. All the companies that Mark's mentioned are the ones who own their business rather than just cruising and worrying about the profit margin and keeping costs under control. But, I mean, Tracy also mentioned a second wave. I haven't heard Rishi Sunak or the Bank of England talk about a second wave, no, have you? but I have seen it in the press all the time. And I think... Yeah, I mean, it's and, and this is the problem, isn't it? There's no confidence. And this is what worries me, is there isn't a confidence in the economy. So, you know, my manufacturer customers are holding back on their orders because they're not seeing that confidence. And, and we're not hearing it from government. Uh, you know, talking about ending the furlough scheme as they are doing just doesn't help. Uh, we need some confidence. Simon, uh, are, you, are you hearing talk of the second wave around Westminster? Yes, um, but we have heard of a second wave from the Prime Minister himself. He said there is a second wave in, and he and Matt Hancock has also said that. Um, just because Richie hasn't said it doesn't mean to say the government's not saying it. They, were, they are uh, dual messages being put out, um, one on the health pandemic and one on the economy, and it just leads to further uh, confusion. Yeah, but, because I mean, the furlough scheme stops in October and but, the Bank of England says the recovery will but, be complete by the end of next year. But that's it, that's what they say, but it doesn't mean it'll happen. And I mean, you just look at Australia. I mean, they're lying to me. Australia is in <laughs> the grips of a second wave now and it's far worse than the first wave. There you go. Well, that's a, it's a bit grim, but yes, I suppose we've got to be real about this. But um, Mandy and Tracy, what would you need the government to to do if there was one thing you wanted the government to do now to help you to look for 
uh, you know, at thriving in the future, be it four years or five years, whatever it happens to be, what would that be? I, I've probably got two things, not one. I'm sorry, but the first thing is to sign- <laughs> everybody says that yeah. <laughs> is the first thing is to signal confidence in aerospace. So to start to get the message out that aeroplanes are safe vessels to fly in, in terms of the air quality to do something around testing at airports to make people feel safer traveling through them so that we can increase the number of flights to areas that are safe. I'm not I'm not prescribing that people should travel if it's not safe to do so, but I think we need to do that and maybe have a more nuanced approach to travel corridors. Um, so for example, we've locked down all of Spain, the Canaries and the Balearics, whereas other countries have, haven't gone that far. We've just locked down Belgium, I think Germany's only locked down Antwerp within Belgium. So I think we need maybe a more nuanced approach. Um, My other um, thing I'd like the government to do is to change the job retention scheme into a skills retention scheme. So to look at a model where we use the um, capacity that we have within companies at the moment to train people into the new skills and digitised skills that we need for the future so that the UK is in a position to take first advantage of things when they change. Investment again. Absolutely. And I think it should maybe be something that is a a third the company, a third government and a third the individual. But at least we'll have people doing things and getting more skilled ready for when that work becomes available. And I think that's absolutely critical. Skills have always been the thing that really concerned me because I don't know how you get people out of the kind of low paid work that they're going to lose their jobs in into the new jobs that are going to become available uh, because of technological investment mickey Uh, tracy what what can the government do for you wave your magic wand (laughs) um i think absolutely around skills mandy um it it, it, and it is a real worry to us that there is a there is a gap that we can't seem to uh fill um and i think and ending the furlough scheme as abruptly as they look as though they're going to is not going to help um, because it's not giving small companies that that time to adjust and that time to put these plans in place. We, you know, it, I would imagine that there'll be an. I think you're quite right, Mark. There'll be an awful lot more reductions. There'll be a lot more of unemployment. Um, because of the fear factor. There isn't the confidence in the economy, so what are you going to do? You're going to cut your cost base, and the first place you'll go to is your staff. But also, I think we we need to look at the 18 to 24-year-old group who are going to be worst affected by this pandemic in terms of their future. And if you look at the government's levelling up agenda, um, I think that apprenticeships are one of the things that that help that levelling up. So if you're at university and both of my children at the moment, your course might be changed a little bit and might be paused, but you will still get your qualification. If you're an apprentice that's currently in place and you get made redundant, you pretty much come out with nothing and have to start again from scratch. So I think it's really important that the government makes some announcement about in-placement apprenticeships. In terms of what they've done for apprentices, it, it's it's a great idea to encourage apprenticeships, but the bonus covers 12 weeks wages of a three year course. So basically, the companies that are going to offer apprenticeships are probably going to offer them. It might entice a few companies who've never done that before to offer them. But companies that don't have that work can't can't do anything with that to to train people. And in manufacturing, we've got great facilities. We are going to need advanced manufacturing in the future. Um, we should be training young people to take advantage of that. There was a time, of course, when we used to have an apprenticeship. It's when they meant something. So if you pull up, lost something, and a lot of people didn't. So, you know, I think times have changed. Everyone's clamouring to get into university now. But being a thicko, I really can't understand what these things are for. (laughs) We thought you were talking about your dentures there, Mickey. (laughs) No, they came out years ago. (laughs) (laughs) Mark. Uh, just put your future forecasting hat on and tell us, you know, what exactly are these skills going to be? You know, what's it going to look like? What What's the kind of innovation that's coming through that you can see? Well, well, well I think one of the big things that's going to be part of, you know, it was coming anyway and it's going to be accelerated, I believe, because of the crisis is the whole digital strategies within businesses. And it's going back to this whole notion of investment. And I think you have an opportunity there of whether you're leaving school at 16, 18, university or whatever, that you've got a group of people who will embrace that. And I think it's really important, for example, that you actually, you know, weld these people into the small business world. 
you know, and I think that's where the big, I mean, it's a bit what Mandy and Chris are already saying, that get these young people alongside, pay them to go and work in small businesses as they leave school this summer, as they leave university this summer. It's really important. But digitalization strategies, the use of, um, you know, AI, uh, all sorts of uh, fancy things coming down the line. And I think that's industry 4.0 in terms of how that's going to affect the work of Mandy and, and Tracy. And the young people will embrace that. So we can't let this be a lost generation. Show them what's on offer. It's not a lost generation. Um, you know, and I think what, if I can just make the broader political point, I think the Chancellor's problem is this. Um, the second wave, who knows? Some even say we haven't finished the first one yet. But there's starting to be a panic in government about the cost of exiting the transition period. And Sunak is clawing back every penny because he's going to have to spend money. I mean, it was announced this morning about the £255 million that's being spent to help businesses in Northern Ireland cope with the GB Northern Ireland interface because they won't be able to rip them up and throw them in the bin. So there's £255 million coming from. So I think Sunak's panicking about the bill that's going to, he's going to be have to pick up as well as the as, and I think that's why the, the furlough scheme is ending and for no other reason he's panicking about the overall cost well what about the cost of the unemployment benefit what about the cost of the welfare benefits we've got a factor I, I I agree with you Liz I agree with you Liz I mean obviously I don't want to get into the politics of brexit here but you know we had opportunities to make sure that you know we continue with you know that we've left the EU for God's sake um but, you know, was it really wise to sort of rush into the 31st of December cliff edge when we haven't yet dealt with COVID-19? That's a big political mistake. Um, we could talk about this all day, I think. Um, and it's been really absolutely fascinating. Um, I can see our two youngest members of the team nodding. They've both graduated. <laughs> and uh, that's Harry, who's the podcast producer, and Ben, who is the technical whiz. Um, uh, they're... They were nodding when we were talking about skills. Declan, Simon, what do you think of what <laughs> you've heard? I, I think what we heard today was extremely interesting. And I think that uh, I, 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 I can't disagree with anything that said. Uh, the supply chains are essential to most of our industries, manufacturing, fashion, you know, you name them. I think there are three things, three themes that I heard for discussion. One is rebuilding the economy in the shorter term and that relies on confidence and it relies on uh, health being uh, tackled and this disease being tackled. Uh, the second was about the whole area of uh, connections. We are economically and socially in an interconnected world. That's why supply chains and logistics are so important. But they are disrupted by lockdowns. They are going to be disrupted by Brexit. So how do we adapt and cope with that? Do we end up becoming a little less uh, global and a little more local that we use more and make more closer to home? That has an impact on quality and price and employment as well. And then long range there's the sustainable recovery that we're hoping to build from all of this one that is based on knowledge on automation on the use of data but is also sustainable in climate terms and the critical factor in all of those three is the take up of technology and the use of the best technological processes that are out there already just look at how much zooms and teams has changed the way that office workers operate nowadays and this isn't just for big companies this applies to the very smallest of businesses and to entrepreneurs, far too many of whom are still not online with their own website. You've got to embrace tech to have any hope of surviving in the future. It's called investment, De Declan. <laughs> I was going to say, if you take issue with that call, Declan, not us. <laughs> <laughs> I was also going to say. So I've I've, dis I've disconnected all my calls. I've got off the grid. <laughs> I was also going to say you heard it here first. After forty years, Mickey, you've been right about something. Investment. <laughs> well, if I kept on about it, I knew it happened eventually. <laughs> Stop clock is oh, right twice dear. a day. Uh, if you've if you've had any issues with the technology that's been used to record this video, I blame Mark because he's in the south of France. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> it's always good, it was always good to talk, Mark, because you're enjoying yourself on the south of France. Oh. Could be worse, Mark. Could be Aberdeen. Absolutely. <laughs> well, we're, if it's any consolation, we're about to go into lockdown here shortly anyway, so, hey. Oh, did I? Well, I feel really sorry for you. 
<laughs> they won't let him back into the country. Uh, wait, I'm sorry we've got to leave it there. If you've got anything you do want to tell us about, then please contact us at backinbusiness.org.uk. That's the email address. Find us on Twitter, business underscore backin. Uh, thank you, Mandy, to Tracy, to Mark, and of course to all of the backinbusiness.org.uk team.